Okay, good morning. Looks like it's going to be a very intimate event. Thank you for coming. As usual, I'm going to introduce the scenes that we are going to watch today from the 1990 season one of British BBC series House of Cards, more famous for the American remakes, remake of the 2010s with now infamous Kevin Spacey, with a review of relevant Machiavellian concepts. Doesn't mean that we find these concepts mirrored in the series, but we have to keep that in mind exactly to measure to what extent the main character in the series, Francis Urquhart, played beautifully by Ian Richardson, the, the, the acting by some of the actors is really masterful, is indeed a Machiavellian character, as you find repeated in multiple reviews, blogs, YouTube videos. A claim that is based mostly on the fact that Francis Urquhart is a duplicitous politician and one who will rely heavily on manipulation, abuse of influence and power, even the direct application of violence up to murder. Okay? So, what are the principal element of leadership, of a dynamic leadership for Machiavelli? As we know, it's all about power. However, the good or the bad use of power, according to Machiavelli, will generate two effects with a potential unwanted consequence which makes the third effect. The polarity that we'll find Machiavelli discussing in one of the chapters that we have yet to read but that will be introduced soon in a couple of weeks, the polarity is between love and fear, something we heard mentioned at the beginning of the semester when we watched A Bronx Tale. Charles Palminteri was talking, playing the part of the local mafioso, was talking about love and fear. So a leader will want to be loved because that will increase their power and in turn the power itself may generate more love. Fear may be the result of the fact that a proper leadership, according to Machiavelli, is based on a balance between force and influence, and force will intrinsically, by its own nature, generate fear, and fear can increase the amount of power, but it can degrade into hatred. And both hatred and fear will generate in the citizenry of the state controlled by the leader a certain amount of mistrust. And you don't want to have that because the implication in Machiavelli is that widespread mistrust will translate into a lack of confidence not just in the leadership of a state but in the state itself, in the country, which means that in a country, in, a, in an early modern state that relies heavily on economic growth of a mercantile nature, as it was in the case of Florence, this lack of confidence in the future of the country, in the future of the state under the current leadership, will decrease the efforts, will decrease the investments, and therefore the economy itself will suffer. So it's not just a political issue. To 
to balance this, the prince, according to Machiavelli, has to take good care of their image. Because this image will have a positive effect on love and will uh, compensate for the amount, the inevitable amount of fear that force will generate and will prevent that fear from turning into hatred. That's why the Machiavellian leader has to be duplicitous. And from this point of view, Francis Urquhart, the protagonist of the series, is in fact Machiavellian. Duplicity by itself, however, is not sufficient. Because clearly, you can lie to the citizens, you can pretend to be good, honest, uh, supporting family values, social values, traditional morality, all you want, it doesn't mean that they will believe you, right? Because in order for this image manipulation, for this kind of influence to work, duplicity has to be combined with charisma. That is to say, people have to be drawn to the leader in a natural way, right? Not just based on the element of a projected and well-crafted image. That is to say, in, in modern terms, if you want to become a political leader, if you want to run for a local or a state or a federal position, and let's say you have money, you can hire the best PR firm that there is, that's not enough, right? Because they can help you build an image that on paper would be successful, but unless you have charisma, that by itself, that construction, a well-executed political campaign will not take, lead you into office. Or if it does, it may be a one-stint political career. Okay? And keep in mind that when you put, when you combined, when you combine love and fear correctly, what you have as a result is respect. Respect is the medium, the happy medium between love and fear. A good, a combination of good and bad, right? Of, of positive and negative sentiments, right? And the combination of power and charisma with a well-crafted image will create a lot of influence. Ultimately, you want to build trust because you want the cooperation of the citizens. You want their collaboration. Collaboration in what? In the support of, of course, institutional changes, uh, changes in society, military efforts, but ultimately, the collaboration is collaboration in the game of growth. Because only the game of growth in the field of the economy will have a big impact, a positive impact on the power of the leader because the leader will have more resources to employ both for a game of force and also for a game of influence. Because even a game of influence is expensive, right? In terms of resources. So... Keep that in mind. Of course, you want the citizens to comply, right? You want the citizens to engage in a certain kind of cooperative uh, practice, a set of cooperative or collaborative practices. And from this point of view, keep in mind that this compliance can be voluntary. I love my leader. I want to do what the government wants me to do. It can be involuntary in that I'm being manipulated, and I think this is what I want. But this is, in fact, the result of successful manipulation. And this compliance can be intentional. I'm committed. I've decided that my role will be a supportive role in society. Or can be unintentional, again, based on some misunderstanding that is being engineered. 
whereby I think I'm doing certain things for myself. And instead, I'm being manipulated in playing a game that is to the advantage of the government, to the advantage of the leadership. Of course, you can also force compliance, right? And in the case of Francis Urquhart, force compliance will uh, be, for example, very often through the uh, use of blackmail. So let's come to the character in the series. The first season, called House of Cards, tells you the story of a British politician who's the majority whip in the House of Commons in the British Parliament. The whip is uh, a member of the Parliament who's in charge of rallying the troops, making sure that the members of uh, their party attend the meetings, especially meetings when important discussions are taking place, when important votes are taking place, that participate in committee work, that align more or, self, more or less with the uh, directives of the party. So the whip should not be influencing the votes of members of their party, but they do, right? They do indirectly because they're the ones, as, is, as it is in the case of Francis Urquhart, who help members of their party when they have a personal or a political crisis, bringing the uh, resources of the party to help to remediate any such crisis. And of course, there is a quid pro quo. There is an exchange. I helped you when you needed the party's help with this issue in your district. Now you help the party and you vote as we want you to vote. So it's kind of a backroom boy. That's how Francis Urquhart uh, describe, describes himself. He's a seasoned veteran politician. At the end, in episode, at the beginning, in episode one, we find him uh, having supported the uh, campaign of the member of the party who is becoming prime minister. It's the Conservative Party. And he has been promised a position in the cabinet, a ministry. However, is told that he is to remain the whip, to play that part, that this ministry will not be assigned to him. And this prompts the beginning of the Machiavellian strategies or the duplicitous strategies applied by Francis in order to pro provoke a political crisis that will lead to the resignation of the prime minister and by the end of the first season, which is only four episodes, because BBC is not like uh, the, the American networks, which will milk a story uh, as much as they can. And, and so a British series of four episodes is a, a series of two seasons and 24 episodes in American terms, right? Which is why I wanted to introduce this, because it's such a condensation. And you'll see in how much events happen in 30 minutes or so uh, today. So at the end of the first season, Francis will become the prime minister. In order to do that, he will blackmail uh, the head of uh, the, the PR agency of the party, Warren McNeil, who has, uh, Warren O'Neill, uh, who has a, a cocaine problem and therefore uh, is arrested, can be blackmailed easily, he will intentionally use a young journalist, young and somewhat naive at the end of the, at the beginning of the series, Matty Storin, to leak information to the press that will produce the political crisis that will lead to the resignation of uh, the prime minister. He will uh, um, fabricate evidence to inculpate the brother of the prime minister who's older and not so smart, also practically an alcoholic, and evidence will be fabricated by Francis Urquhart to make the press believe that the prime minister's brother is using inside information 
to buy stocks based on stocks that will be affected by the policies enacted by the prime minister himself. A lot of this goes on, and the final episode from which we will watch 25-30 minutes today, as I said, uh, is, is when everything uh, comes to its uh, ending. Now, Francis Urquhart, we must say, is as much a Shakespearean character as he is a Machiavellian character. And in some ways, he is both. Because in modern politics, at this level, someone who's one of the leaders of the Conservative Party in England, in Great Britain, and um, someone who will become a prime minister, you wouldn't expect this person in real life to do everything by himself. And Francis does a lot by himself, which is both Shakespearean, because of course, a tragedy in Shakespeare is the tragedy of a character. It's a personal tragedy, right? It, it's not the kind of tragedy that affects society or a community. It, it extends, the effects extend to, to a larger context, but it's primarily the inner turmoil of a character. It, it's primarily the personal tragic destiny of a character, whether it be Richard III, Hamlet, uh, Macbeth, uh, etc. But even when you look at Machiavelli, Machiavelli thinks of this leader who does everything, right? Cesare Borgia, who does, who's the head of a political council, who's running an army and is the leader of the army and goes to the battlefield and then is also uh, the head of the diplomatic enterprise of his own uh, state and goes to Rome to talk to cardinals, etc. So it's very much a one-man operation, right? Which is, is really a, a, a shortcoming of Machiavelli's view. This leader who's very much alone. And in fact, Cesare Borgia himself, in the end, will fail because his decisions taken by himself, uh, ultimately in reference in regards to the election of the new pope, will not be good enough, okay? But it's a Shakespearean character, not only because he does a lot of things directly by himself, there is a lot of direct action, he's involved directly in evil, in evil doing, but of course, as you will see uh, in here, uh, a lot of people die, and we will not get to uh, the end, uh, the end of the first season, uh, at the end of the first season, Francis will take this young journalist, with whom he also has uh, a, a romantic and a sexual relationship, will take her and throw her down uh, from uh, a, a roof garden in uh, the, the building of the, the party to kill her before uh, she can uh, uh, write about. At this point, she has found out what the Duplistos game played by Francis was, and she's about to reveal everything. And she's also very enraged that she was manipulated, and he eliminates her. But it's only one of the characters that is being killed. The game played by Francis is, to a certain extent, Machiavellian, because he relies on influence. In his case, influence means manipulation of trust and mistrust. He creates trusts, for example, he manipulates this young journalist into trusting him, into thinking that he is one of the old boys, one of the old gentlemen who's honest, committed to uh, crown and country. And he creates mistrust in competitors because he uh, circulates a lot of misinformation that will lead Matty, the journalist, and others not to trust other members of the Conservative Party and to suspect that they are, in fact, responsible for everything that Francis is doing. And he relies on force, initially for the first three seasons, the first three episodes especially, in the form of blackmail, because blackmail is a kind of force compliance, right? So even though you're not using a gun saying you have to do this, essentially, it is a, 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 a low-level use of force. And then to the highest level, 
where uh, Francis himself will kill Warren O'Neill by mixing cocaine with rat poison. And when O'Neill will take that cocaine, he will die. He throws Marty from the roof, killing her. Okay? So we start from the campaign that is leading to the appointment of Francis Urquhart as Prime Minister of England. And from the very first scene, we'll see uh, a, a case of forced compliance or blackmail because a tape that was uh, um, produced by Francis himself. Francis himself went into the bedroom during the conference of the party of a rival member of the party, left there a, a, a case, a briefcase, with a microphone, and he knew he had arranged for a sexual encounter to take place there. He has, the, the, he has this tape uh, of, of the sexual encounter, and the tape is delivered to the house of this uh, politician, where the wife will listen to it, the politician will withdraw from the campaign, and, and therefore uh, there are fewer competitors. One has been eliminated already uh, from the campaign, eliminated through a smear campaign, and uh, another will be eliminated later, and Francis will remain the only valid candidate for the position of prime minister. Okay? Now, the problem we have, what, what is questionable, and I'll want to hear your uh, comments now or Monday, Francis has influence, has power, but what about love, fear, and hatred? How is it doing in regards to those essential elements? And more importantly, he is powerful and duplicitous. He is influential, but does he have charisma? Mm. I don't think so. And no matter how good Ian Richardson is playing this character, no matter how good Kevin Stacy is playing the character of Frank Underwood in the American version of House of Cards, the amount of charisma displayed by those characters is, in my view, questionable. But uh, I'm interested in hearing uh, different views. So here we go. Stupid head straight, all right? Okay. And this time I'm not asking if you want to provide notes about this, that's fine, but I'm not asking you to, right? Just, just enjoy this, just think about it, and if not today, on Monday, I will ask you your feedback. Nigel? That's, um, that's Francis. I'm sorry? Is that Francis? No, it isn't. This is Warren O'Neill, who, who's just been left by Penny, his companion and assistant, because Penny is the woman who was forced to have sex, uh, the, the sex uh, affair, the intercourse that was taped uh, to ruin the reputation of the other member of the Conservative Party. So he's the drug addict in charge of PR who is blackmailed into providing uh, incriminating information to Francis so that Francis can use that information to ruin the political career of other influential members of the party. I stopped it here because from the, get, from the very first line we, we find the other conservative politician, Walton, at breakfast with his wife and he is reading from the newspaper and providing a recap of the run to nominate a prime minister to appoint a member of the party as prime minister. So I wanted that to be ready. Those who wish to wear their social consciences will support Michael Samuel. Did he and Roger know each other well? I don't think so. Roger was doing some work for him recently. Urquhart uh, was angry with him, some sort of cock-up over computer files. Penny, you know Urquhart has a country house? Yes. 